continent from the far wilds of northern Newfoundland, where, which Mike uh, and Virginia just returned from last night. Um, our, we're fortunate to have Mike uh, Adler here to talk to us about uh, the, the beginning and the end, uh, basically. And there's uh, probably, arguably, nobody in town more capable of doing this, providing this uh, summary than what Mike is able to do here. He's a 1971 graduate of MIT, has a PhD in solid state geophysics, solid state physics. And he had a nearly 30 year career with General Electric, uh, where he spent time guiding, developing large research programs. After GE, uh, he worked to develop microcells, fuel cells for devices such as cell phones. He's been an adjunct professor at Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Published over 100 technical papers, he's been active in the IEEE, uh, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. I have to write that down, otherwise I cannot remember that. Uh, he was elected an IEEE Fellow for his work on power devices and was president of the organization in 2003. When they're not traveling many places around the world, he and his wife, Virginia, uh, have lived here in Jackson Hole for uh, 13 or 14 years now, uh, where um, you know, he's been a member, a long-standing member of the geologists of Jackson Hole, and probably, with one exception, he's probably given more talks on behalf of the geologists of Jackson Hole than uh, just about anybody else. He's passionate about the night sky, um, takes stunning photos of uh, celestial bodies. So there's a relationship to his intro, greater interest in the universe, and you've probably seen his photos in the lobby out here when there was, in the gallery when they they were on display here. They've been out here twice, the beginning of this year, Mike, I think, yeah. and then uh, about a year before that. But um, other hobbies are skiing, climbing, hiking, photography. He's a true Renaissance man. And we're fortunate tonight to have him here to talk about I'll just say the beginning and the end and everything in between. So if you join me in welcoming Mike Adler. satellite 
that has provided very detailed measurements of what is known as the cosmic microwave background radiation, a relic from uh, radiation from the Big Bang. Then we're going to talk about the Higgs, uh, implications for stability in our universe, as well as uh, possibility that it may be uh, related to the cause of this inflation that I'll be talking about. Then we're going to talk about um, how inflation makes it likely, maybe even possibly, or maybe even likely, that we're not alone, that is, there's an infinite number of universes. And it's just, it's pretty amazing. There was an article that I, I, I got, I subscribed to the Astronomy Magazine, and it just, I just got it this afternoon, and the title of it is Multiverses, Science or Science Fiction. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a topic of a, a lot of interest at the moment. Then we're going to talk about sort of the beginning and the end, and I'll, so I'll, end, I'll end the talk with this, which is how the universe may have begun, like from nothing, and of what its ultimate fate will be. Uh, and the, this last topic is definitely in the category of what we don't know. I mean, this is uh, highly special. <laughs> uh, but there are some ideas about it. OK, so um, the standard Big Bang model. Uh, in the 20s, uh, the conventional wisdom was that the universe had existed forever. It, it hadn't changed. It's uh, just been there. And uh, Einstein modified his theory of general relativity uh, to uh, put in, a, uh, put in a, uh, a, a, an additional term to keep the months, to make that happen. And then when in the 20s, when Ed Hubble showed that the universe was not static, it's expanding, uh, Einstein said, that's the, my greatest blunder uh, of, of doing that. But it turned out Einstein's, the term he put in has been used in a different way, uh, very uh, creatively uh, in the understanding or the development of theory for the uh, Big Bang. But then in the 30s, uh, and just in the 30s, uh, a, a Belgian physicist named Georges uh, Lemaitre, Catholic priest, proposed that the universe at some time began as almost a primeval atom where all space and time was in one tiny little uh, uh, location, and it, it, it came into existence uh, by expanding from that. This was later in the, um, uh, by a, another scientist called Fred Hoyle at a broadcast on BBC, and he called it the Big Bang Idea, and that's where the name came from. Uh, but he wasn't actually a proponent of the Big Bang. He was, he was a proponent of the steady state model, that the universe is really not changing, or if it's changing, it's changing it in, in a cyclic way. Um, but one key aspect of the uh, Big Bang is the existence of this cosmic radiation, uh, which the Planck satellite was looking at. And when it was confirmed, it, it pretty much uh, ended the debate as to whether the Big Bang uh, is real or not, or, and, and, uh, because that's a direct consequence. And I, I'll, I'll talk some, a lot more about that. OK, so here's a, what is the Big Bang? Uh, what is the Big Bang model? So let's uh, focus on this uh, diagram over here. And it starts from nothing. Okay, we'll talk about what nothing really is. In fact, there's a book. It's a book. It's called uh, yeah, A Universe from Nothing by uh, Jeff Trouss. And uh, so the universe began from nothing. But then it, uh, it went through a rapid expansion phase. And this is what I mean by inflation, where it expanded 27 order of magnitude. So that's one followed by 27 zeros. And it happened in 10 to the minus 34 seconds, which is zero point, then a bunch of 34 zeros and, and a one. So this this is an, 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 this is the bang in the Big Bang. And then uh, the universe went through a, a period where it, uh, where basically everything that we know was involved. And I'll, I'll refer to this one here. So you have um, uh, all the forces in nature: electromagnetic force, the weak force, the strong force. Uh, were once one uh, one force, but as as the universe expanded and cooled, these forces became uh, uh, were split off, so they had their own identities. Then, at about one microsecond after the Big Bang, protons and neutrons were formed uh, at, in uh, in the order of uh, 0.01 seconds, a hundredth of a second, nuclear fission. Then, the light elements were created: deuterium, helium, lithium, and certainly uh, hydrogen. Uh, then, the, as the universe is expanding, uh, the, the density of uh, the energy and the radiation diminished, and it became dominated by matter uh, about 5,000 years after the Big Bang. But then a major event occurred 4, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. 
So here, up until then, what you had is a lot of radiation, and you had these particles, but the particles, protons, electrons, they're charged particles, and they cause, they cause the light to be scattered. So you can't, there, there, there's nothing that you can see that goes back uh, uh, that far. But at 4,000, 400,000 years, the uh, atoms form, and so they're neutral, and light that isn't scattered anymore. And so this radiation is now free to uh, 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 propagate. And this is the cosmic microwave radiation that, uh, that it, it, it engulfs us as we speak, right here. Uh, and it, it tells us an awful lot. It turns out the study of it is telling us an awful lot. Then, uh, as you evolve beyond that, the first stars were about 560 million years. Then galaxies, we all know that our, 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 our galaxy was formed about 10 billion years ago. Three, and uh, our Earth was about five, no, five billion years ago. So that's kind of that's kind of the Big Bang and, uh, and uh, how it's evolved. Um, and just to uh, uh, this explosion, particularly this inflation period where the universe expanded, this was way faster than the speed of light. And so, if you, if a lot of you know, Einstein said nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, it turns out that doesn't apply to space. And so what, what, what you really can look at is expansion of the universe more like co uh, coins on a, a balloon. They're, as you blow up a balloon, the coins are moving apart from each other, but not because of their own motion, but because that the balloon is expanding. And that's what happens in the universe. Uh, everything is expanding away from each other, but only because the space is expanding, not because they actually are moving. Uh, by themselves. Now they have some movement, but the big picture is the space movement. Uh, and then, so this, uh, this, this uh, I, I mentioned uh, that Hubble in, in the 20s determined that the universe uh, was expanding. Uh, he did more than that, though. Uh, he plotted the velocity. He found out that the velocity that uh, uh, the objects are. Uh, are separated from each other is directly proportional to their distance. So if something is 10 times farther away, it's moving 10 times faster. Uh, and and, and this, this, rule, this law seemed to hold pretty well, but then if you get up to uh, something on the order of 10 billion years, so recently, in the last 20 years, there's been studies of uh, galaxies that are 10 uh, billion uh, light years away. And what they found out was that for a given speed, and redshift, in this case, it's actually the velocity that these things are separated. For given speed, they're further away than you would have guessed just by uh, Hubble's straight line, and this this means that the universe is accelerating. And um, th this this was a huge surprise. Uh, this, in fact, maybe one of the biggest surprises in physics uh, in the last hundred years, and because the the force that we know of that operates over the longest distance is gravity, and gravity is is. Uh, is not, uh, is re it, it, it uh, brings things together, it's uh, attractive. And uh, this, uh, it, it, for the universe to be actually accelerating, in the, there has to be something like negative gravity. Uh, and this has now been called dark energy. We'll be talking about that. And a Nobel Prize, this, this little discovery here, uh, led to a Nobel Prize in 2011. So it's a big deal. Uh, okay, so what about, the, what we say about our universe? Well, so we have this uh, stuff called dark energy, which is negative gravity, and uh, we have matter. So these, the, the evolution of the universe is often illustrated by a graph like this. So if you have, on this axis, you have dark energy, and on this axis, you have matter. Um, and depending on what value there is for these various uh, things, like matter, like over here, if, if you happen to have lots of matter and not much of, of this, uh, you have a closed universe, which is eventually going to collapse, and that's called the Big Crunch, um, uh, as opposed to the Big Bang. And um, it's uh, and in addition to that, this the shape of space uh, is curved, so light does not travel in straight lines in a universe of this type. It is bent. If you all know, or most of you probably know, that light bends around uh, uh, heavy objects like the sun. Well, it turns out the average amount of it, uh, matter in the universe affects the overall curvature of the universe uh, in addition to you know smaller uh, things that happen close to massive objects like our sun or, or a galaxy. But on the average, the universe will have curvature if it's in the close. 
Now, another, uh, another extreme is that it's an open universe, and low in matter, and, uh, and this, is open. this universe is open, it is, and light is bent in the other direction. Uh, and, uh, but it's not, it does not travel in straight lines, so the universe has a different shape to it. And depending on uh, exactly what value you have for this dark energy, it, uh, it, it, could, it could expand forever, and, uh, and, it, and, that's, uh, and that's up in this realm. Uh, and now this is the data that all these experiments uh, produced. Now there's, uh, so this is the supernova data that I just showed you. When you extrapolate that, put it on it, you get this uh, line that runs like this. Then there's some other data from clusters of galaxies. Uh, and then there's the data from the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this line here is, is divides between closed and open, and it's called flat. But this is really confusing to people when you talk about a flat universe. What flat means, if, you, if the uh, sum of the, uh, the ordinary matter and the uh, dark uh, energy is unity, uh, which it means that the universe is at something called the critical density. And a universe at the critical density, the light travels in a straight line. And that's what, uh, that's what a flat universe means. The light is not bent. It doesn't mean that the universe is flat geometrically. It just means that light isn't bent. But it's a very unusual thing. This thing has got to sum up exactly to one for this to happen. It's, it, it's, and uh, you'll, you'll notice how this data lines up along that line. So, it, it, so if you just look at this data, you see here we are. They, cro they cross nicely. Uh, and here you are. So most of the universe is made up, 70% is made up of dark uh, energy. Uh, about 30% uh, is, is uh, matter. And, uh, uh, and the universe is going to expand forever. It's in this region of, of the graph. And yeah, and of course, an open universe that is going to expand forever, uh, what they call that is uh, the big freeze. Uh, as opposed to the big crunch, the big bang, the big freeze. And um, so, uh, this, so this is what we know, uh, and this is based on data that's been uh, gathered over the last 10 years. It doesn't include the Planck data, but we'll get into that. Planck data doesn't disagree with this, it just refines it. Uh, but so interestingly enough, so we have uh, what this data says is that 70% uh, of, uh, of is something called dark energy, 30% is, is matter, but it turns out all that 30% only 4.9% of matter is ordinary matter, and the rest of the matter is something called dark matter, which I'll uh, just talk about in a second. Um, and surprisingly, the universe is flat, and life has not been, even though it seems like, how, why would that happen? Well, we'll talk about that. Okay, so here's, here was, dark matter was kind of guessed at some years ago, and it was guessed at because the things that astronomers can measure right here in our own galaxy did make sense. So here you have the rotational speed of the galaxy as a function of the distance away from the center. And this is, the, here's our sun by the way, uh, uh, and this is what it should have done. If, you, if all the matter, the matter, only matter that existed was matter that you could see, uh, like the stars and, and, and dust and gas, the rotational speed should have rolled, fallen, fallen off like this but it didn't, it goes like this. So what does that mean? It means that there's some other matter that we can't see, but is there. Why do we know it's there? Because its effects, the, the, its gravity is causing the speed to actually uh, stay constant and increase slightly as you go away from the center of it. So this was the first hint of uh, dark uh, uh, energy matter. And, uh, uh, and, and in fact, 85% of um, well, 85% of the mass of the galaxy is due to the presence of, of this dark matter. And, and, and so uh, of, the, of the 0.31 of matter in the universe, 30% are only, uh, only 0.04 or 0.05 is, is regular matter, and the rest is this dark, uh, dark matter. So most of the universe is made up of something dark uh, that we can't see. Um, so here's the makeup of the universe. Um, very little radiation. Uh, radiation is still there, but it, it, it was the dominant energy form very early in the game, but it's, uh, it no longer is. Matter took over. So what you have is 4.9% is normal matter, including planets, stars, galaxies, gas dust, plasma, black holes, and of this, a tenth of a percent are neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos do have mass. 
And then, uh, the, then 26.8% is this dark matter, a type of matter that interacts gravitationally, but is different from all the particles in the standard model that it does not interact with light. It interacts with light through this effect on gravity, because uh, light is bent uh, by gravity, but um, it does not, you can't see it. And then the whopping 68% uh, is this dark energy which is causing the universe to accelerate. Uh, and this is kind of what the standard Big Bang model run uh, uh, comes down to. This is the size of the universe of this axis. This is time. Zero is now. One minus one was the, essentially the Big Bang, and uh, it going along. And then you see it, it, it getting a, a move up. And the reason, so the universe is accelerating, and it's because of this dark energy. One of the properties of dark energy, it, uh, as we understand it, is it has constant energy density which means as the universe gets bigger, there's more of it. And that's why, uh, that's why the, the universe is accelerating in its expansion. The standard model also properly predicts, uh, the standard Big Bang model, the existence of this microwave radiation and, and, it, and its temperature. And it also properly predicts the amount of primordial elements such as hydrogen deuterium. So this is a major success. The Big Bang model explains an awful lot. But it doesn't explain everything. Um, and uh, one of the problems is why does light travel in a straight line when, when you had to have this nice combination of, of uh, dark energy and, and matter sum up into unity, whereas it could be almost anything else. And it turns out, um, when you go through the math of this, the, uh, the state of uh, flatness or where uh, light isn't bent is unstable. It's like a top that's spinning and any little perturbation, call it the tip over. And uh, so, uh, but it, here it is. So why did, why is it? It seems unlikely that uh, it, it wouldn't happen unless something made it happen. The second problem is why do we see this, this radiation, the cosmic microwave radiation, comes at us from all directions, 13, and it arrives for 13.8 billion years. Uh, we're now getting it. Um, so, but it's coming from left and right. And that sort of says, how can that happen? If it all was once in a single space, how can it be uh, coming at us uh, from opposite directions? And it's totally uniform, it looks the same in every direction you look at. So what, what's going on here? Uh, and then the third item is how did the origin of, uh, how did the origin of structure of the universe uh, occur? Because um, at the time of the Big Bang, the universe would have been perfectly normal in density, but how did all of us happen? How did all the stars, how did, where did those initial clumpiness, how did that all happen? So in 1984, uh, Alan Goose, who's now a professor at MIT, proposed something called inflation, uh, and I, I will uh, uh, I will try to ma uh, make you let you uh, see if you can up if you can understand it a little bit. What it is, it's a process that caused the universe to expand, you know, this tremendous amount. Um, and what it's caused by, he proposes this. He says there's a Higgs-like field, and you know, it's the field associated with the Higgs boson. Uh, but I, I use the words Higgs-like because it might not be the Higgs, and, uh, but a Higgs-like field, and it has the, it has the property that it, it has uh, the same value everywhere, and it has an energy even at zero field. And so this is, uh, this is kind of like what a Higgs-like field looks like. It's zero energy, and it has a constant energy density in this, in this region. And it happens to have a property that it's, uh, it, 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 it causes uh, things to move apart. It's, it has an anti-gravity property. And, and how do you know this? A very simple experiment. If you have some, they call this false vacuum, this stuff. If you have a false vacuum and then you pull your, on your hand and you extend it, you now have extra volume. Well, that means this is bigger. And if this is that constant energy density, there's more energy now than there was before. So the person holding, doing that hand experiment had to be doing some work to make, uh, because all of a sudden there's more energy. So it had to come from that motion. And that can only, that means that there was the, the false vacuum was exerting a, a compressive force, a force that was resisting the expansion, and that's the negative pressure. And so that's the nature of a, a false vacuum. And so Alan posed that this small region of this false vacuum uh, uh, would exi exist. It. And if you follow, if you say, all right, what does general relativity say about this kind of stuff? The universe will expand exponentially, very fast, just like I, 10, 
25 orders of magnitude in 10 to the minus 34 seconds, you have 34 zeros. Uh, amazing stuff. So, uh, and uh, the nature of this is uh, interesting. It's much faster than the speed of light, as I said earlier, uh, but it doesn't, uh, it still agrees with the theory of relativity because it's space that's expanding, not the actual objects aren't moving faster than the speed of light. They're, they're separating, but it's because space is expanding. And since the energy density of this Higgs-like field is constant and the universe is expanding 25 orders of magnitude, that means that the energy, the total energy of the universe is expanding three times that. So 10 to the, uh, more than three times, 10 to the 75th. So the energy uh, in the universe is just going crazy. Now, what's amazing about this is that the net energy is zero. So how can that happen? How can this, uh, this uh, Higgs-like field cause, which is expanding uh, extremely fast, filling the universe with this false vacuum at the end, at a tremendous energy, total energy, and the total energy is zero. And the reason is, that as the universe is expanding and, more, and, and, and the, uh, at this uh, incredible rate, but also you know, very fast, that areas that, uh, that uh, are now expanded have a gravitational field, and a gravitational field uh, uh, produces just a, a, uh, as a negative, a potential energy, which is negative. So the energy, the, the, you have this tremendous energy in the, uh, in the field, but uh, the, the gravitational field and the potential energy is balanced off exactly. And so the end result is a universe with zero energy, just balanced off. And Alan Guth calls this the ultimate free lunch. So you could have a universe that's expanding uh, tremendously, filled with matter, filled with this uh, uh, dark uh, energy, and uh, yet the total energy is zero. And, uh, and so, this is, so this, this is what cosmic inflation is all about. It sounds pretty preposterous, but believe it or not, it actually explains an awful lot. Um, and the state of this false vacuum is metastable, so what happens is uh, the, uh, the state dro eventually drops down in slow rolls, and it eventually uh, uh, converts all this uh, energy, converts into the energy of particles, and, and, and the universe is called, it's called reheating. And all the, all the radiation and particles that are associated with the standard Big Bang model are now created. Uh, and so this, this evolves neatly into the Big Bang, but it, it um, so, okay, so here he is, he has this, uh, we, we've ex we have this, uh, what's called cosmic inflation. Uh, so how does it explain this, the problems that I alluded to earlier? Well, the one about the flatness of the universe, now this is a, the math works it out perfectly, but I'm going to show you, give you a, a, a more of an easy to see explanation. If the universe had some curvature, but now it expands, you know, 25 orders of magnitude, any curvature, uh, like this is, shows a little mouse on it, any curvature is, going to, is almost going to be gone. And that's in fact what happens, that the curvature is driven to virtually zero space, spaces, the curvature in space, and so that the uh, universe has this property that it's at critical density and uh, light is not uh, light is not bent. And uh, okay, so how does it solve another of the problems? How does it solve the problem of the this cosmic radiation coming at us uh, from right and left, 13.8 billion uh, light years away, and yet it was once in the same spot? And it solves that problem, and that's called the horizon problem, because imagine a, a tiny little a hunk of, uh, of matter located in points A and B, then inflation hits. These points A and B now, you can't see them anymore because they've now blown out way beyond uh, your, uh, your visual horizon. And, uh, but eventually, the uh, light from them uh, traveling at its, it seems like this uh, at a very slow speed, but it eventually arrives at you. And so you begin to see the light from the same two points. And since it started at the same place, it's exactly the same stuff. So that's why light right and left on both sides uh, comes together, and it looks uh, it looks uh, just like, it, and that's why uh, it, it seems to, at the surface of it, maybe violate uh, 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 yeah, the concern of speed of light, uh, uh, nothing traveling faster than the speed of light, but it happens because of the space expanded so fast. Okay, and then. Um, 
we're going to now talk about the third of the problems, which is um, which is why where did the structure of the universe come from, and how do, what how is the CMB, the cosmic microwave radiation, help us sort this out? So. Uh, I, I sort of alluded to this already. Uh, after the universe cooled to about 3,000 K at 3,800 years, it, the neutral atoms of hydrogen and helium formed. And so the light that was uh, present and was scattered before is no longer scattered. And this is known as decoupling or recombination. And it's kind of like uh, you know, looking at a sky with clouds. You can't see beyond the cloud layer. Well, that's pretty much what's happening here. Because light was scattered um, uh, uh, before the, this decoupling period, you can't see any of what has happened before this period at, at 380,000 years. But if something affected the light, this, the, uh, uh, the radiation back then, and, it, it, and it, it might exist in the cosmic radiation itself, then, then you could see something. And that's the key. Um, uh, and so the, uh, the time of decoupling uh, was, uh, the universe was a thousand times smaller. The 3000 K is the sort of the temperature at which uh, atoms are formed. And now that temperature, that uh, radiation that uh, that's, we are invaded in uh, is, has a temperature of 3.75 K, very cold, uniform to one part in 10, uh, in 10 to the fifth. So the study of the CMB radiation uh, and I'll show you what, what, what information it has here in a second. The study of it has provided the most detailed information on the nature of the universe. And so, uh, and one of the, the key questions is where did the structure come from in the universe? And the, or, the origin is, is it's critical because otherwise we wouldn't exist. Uh, there wouldn't be, uh, everything would be perfectly uniform early on. So the way it happened is, is through the, uh, uh, some wondrous uh, uh, properties of quantum physics and that quantum fluctuations occur in empty space all the time. Particles are created and, 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 uh, and, and recombined, created all the time. But normally they disappear very quickly. But during this period of, of uh, inflation, they're actually stretched and survive. And they cause some of the regions that are exiting inflation uh, before, to exit before others. And it produces small density fluctuations uh, uh, that uh, will later uh, uh, density variations and these, these small density variations are the nucleus of all the structure in the universe. So one quantum fluctuation produces a small variation in regular matter, but there's dark matter also, and it produces a, a, a fluctuation in the dark matter uh, uh, there. And these variations are critical, as I've said, they, they are the origin of all the structure in the universe. But these dens this density variations uh, affect the radiation, the light, that, uh, in the CMB in this case, because uh, pro a property of general relativity is that matter and gravity, light is, light is affected by matter and gravity. And so through that, these density variations in matter uh, affect the radiation itself. They implant, implant, imprint their effect on the uh, cosmic radiation. And so the way this works is you have, imagine one, uh, one regular matter blip caused by uh, a fluctuation, it would, it would have propagated through the early universe as a, what's called a cosmic sound wave, very near, uh, very much like dropping a rock in a pond, producing a little blip in the middle and a wave that's, uh, that moves out. The dark matter uh, also induces a blip in the light, but since the dark matter is not coupled to the light, it stays put. And gradually, you have the, the, the center, the distance between these, as time goes on, gets farther and farther away. But at 380,000 years, it, um, uh, light and matter become decoupled. And that's the end. So the, because you're now left with these two blips, one here and one 300, uh, one that's, that's propagated uh, during this period of 380,000 years. So there's a pair of correlated fluctuations and isotropies. And these are frozen in the CMB. Uh, and they exist. The, 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 the whole pattern you know, is the sum of all of the quantum fluctuations that exist. And it, you get something that looks like this. And so this is what, this is the data that, that, that the Planck satellite produced. And what you're looking at is the uh, variation in the temperature of this cosmic radiation. And the, the color tells you the story. The darker blue is colder, the lighter, redder, oranger, uh, is hotter, and these are these are not uh, this is 
they're only up by one part in 10 to the fifth. So this is still very uniform. But this was critical because uh, uh, it, 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 it is the origin of, uh, of, the, uh, of all the structure in the universe. So what do we learn from that? Well, that's very nice, but what do we learn from it? So you have these pairs uh, of, uh, of uh, anisotropy, these fluctuations in the uh, light, density, variations in the temperature of the light. And there are every, every one, there are lots and lots of them, but they're all, they're all separated by the same amount of space because they all, they all occurred in the same amount of time. They, they propagated, the sound wave propagated the same, so they're, so they're a yardstick in the sky. And that, uh, so the spacing between these coupled uh, anisotropies in the cosmic radiation is, has a tremendous amount of information in it. And why does that? Well, the light that we're now getting, that we're now seeing in the CMD, had to travel through the entire, uh, uh, had a long journey, 13.8 uh, billion years, to get to us. And it's, it, it was affected by the curvature, any curvature in, in the universe. So remember I said that if it was a heavy mass, uh, the, if the universe was very, uh, was very heavy, lots of matter, uh, it would bend the light. And that's what you're seeing here, is here's our yardstick. And because the light is bent the, uh, as it's coming towards us, it makes the yardstick look larger. And then if it was a very, if the matter was, uh, was a lot less matter, uh, light would have been bent the other way, and the yardstick would have looked smaller to us. But if the universe had this critical density, the light would, the yardstick would look, uh, the light would travel in a straight line, and it would just be, uh, it, would, it would be the size that would be associated with a light not being bent at all. Uh, but so any curvature in the, uh, in the, in the universe, the space, uh, would cause this, so that's why this yardstick these, the distance between these little blips is uh, it, it has so much information in it. And so what is done is that uh, the, uh, the, 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 these experiments like the Planck and there's a US for look at these, uh, the spacing where we started to see correlated, uh, um, uh, correlated blips. And it turns out the first one you see, the, the one that's the largest in the sky, is about six tenths of a degree. Uh, there's nothing longer because the light out there isn't correlated. But at, at six tenths of a degree, you see a blip. And it turns out that blip is exactly the, if you do the theory, is exactly this, the uh, uh, size that would mean that we have a universe with no spatial curvature, critical density. And then there's some higher order blips that occur at uh, smaller scales. And there's a lot of information that you can get about curve, uh, dark energy, baryon matter. Lots of more information comes up. But just this first simple, this large blip here immediately tells us that the universe is, uh, <coughs> has no spatial curvature. And uh, what's, what's really in, uh, 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 cool about this is oh, the, the actual spacing that that will have grown to now uh, those uh, that the spacing at three, over from 380,000 years to now results in a spacing at 480 million light years at the moment. So when we when scientists looked at the spacing between galaxy clusters, and so this is galaxy uh, uh, correlation function and the distance between uh, the galaxies, lo and behold, there's a peak at 480 million light years away, and isn't that amazing? What it tells you is that the structure of the universe was, in fact, the, the cosmic microwave radiation, the, the blips in it, are the blueprint of all the structure in the universe. And uh, so it's a, it's a very impressive demonstration of the success of the model. And um, there was a Nobel Prize given for, the, uh, for uh, this discovery of the CMB. But the people who figured out what it was telling you uh, didn't get anything. It was just these guys who measured the radiation they thought it was. Uh, they thought it was uh, 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 radiation that was scattered from uh, bird dung, and so. Uh, but they they, uh, they got the Nobel Prize for it, nonetheless. Uh, but it was a big deal. So okay. So now now we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the actual data of um, these satellites. So over the last 25 years, there's been three satellites that have looked at this radiation. Up until 1990. Uh, 
people tried to see these, this caused the, the variation in the light, but it looked totally uniform from the surface of the Earth because it was one part in 10 to the fifth, and you couldn't measure it that accurately from experiments based on the surface. So the COBE satellite in 1990 was the first to see it. And here you see a, a comparison, actually, of the three sets of data. But this is, COBE saw it this way. And that was a big deal because in addition, the, the Big Bang model says, yes, there has to be cosmic radiation, microwave radiation, but there, it can't be perfectly uniform. There had to be some, some structure in it that is the blueprint for the uh, structure of matter in the universe, structure in the universe. So the fact that they couldn't see it was troubling. But finally, Kobe saw it. Then WMAP, WMAP is a US satellite launched in 2000 and it much higher resolution. And the Planck, which is a European Space Agency, uh, launched in 2010 has three times the resolution of, of, the, yeah, of even the WMAP. And so a tremendous amount of information uh, come, came out of this. And this came out of a, a recent article, Planck of Whole Standard Co Cosmology. And, uh, but this is not easy stuff because this is the final result. But the, to get to this result of those temperature fluctuations, you had to subtract out all the other microwave radiation that's in our galaxy. And there's a lot of it. And so it, uh, this is just, all these colors are different <coughs> pollutants, so to speak, in this data. Uh, radiation from dust, yellow carbon monoxide, electrons, uh, all of this has to be carefully measured and then subtracted from the uh, initial measurement uh, through many steps to get to the final measurement. So uh, it, the fact is it, it, took them, uh, it took them three years to, uh, to do this. And you can see the results of the theory. Here's the Planck data and here's that first blip. Um, and notice how, smooth, how the, there's very little noise in the, in the data. This is the uh, W map and there's a lot more noise uh, in the data. So it's much, in the model, the fit of the model is just exquisite. It's just uh, beautiful. And um, turns out uh, most of the radiation initially was unpolarized. Um, you know, like you're looking out with polarized glasses, you look at a reflected light. It, uh, it, it, the light, so polarized glasses allow only light uh, uh, from one polarization to uh, get you. So that, that light, polarizing, uh, polarization of light car, can come from many effects, but uh, there was some initial polarization that occurred right almost at the time of uh, this decoupling. But then after stars were formed 560 million years uh, later, the stars now cause uh, atoms to be uh, uh, ionized again, and you get some more polarization. So the plank, the latest data that came up this year was this polarization data. And it showed, for example, uh, it, uh, that the first stars were formed 560 million years after the Big Bang, rather than 400. And this fits a lot closer to what astronomers had felt with the age of the oldest stars. And this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the data, the modeling of the data is extremely accurate. They, uh, uh, they had the nine frequencies and, uh, and seven acoustic speed uh, acoustic peaks versus phi for WMAP. So this is what it came up with. Uh, and, and there's a whole mess of parameters here, which I'm not going to tell you, except for the ones that uh, the most that uh, are easiest to understand is the amount of normal matter comes out of this, the amount of dark matter comes out of this, slightly different, and the uh, dark energy is slightly different from what uh, we heard before. Um, the dark energy is repulsive gravity, as I mentioned, it was first introduced by uh, Einstein in his, uh, to make the universe unchanging. It turns out the dark energy that we now have is causing the universe to change in the way that causes is causing it to accelerate. The age of the universe also pops out of here, and it's a little older than it was before, at 13.8 billion years instead of 13.7. And the other thing that comes out of the data with a great accuracy, that we are at the critical density within a quarter of a percent, and that those numbers sum up to unity uh, to a quarter of a percent. So the universe is flat, uh, and, it, and the, the explanation is this expansion of, of, of call it, call it inflation. Uh, so what is the size of the universe? Uh, the part of the universe we can see is 46.1 or so billion light years in size, even though the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. How can that be? 
And, uh, and the reason is that the light reaching us now came from galaxies that are now 46 billion light years away. So there, because the universe is expanding. How, what, what, what light, how much of the universe do we, can we not see? Well, the non-observable is way bigger, and it's estimated to be you know, 23 orders of magnitude bigger. So there's a whole mess of the universe that, we, that that's way bigger than what we can see, that we can't see. We have no idea what's going on. But the, since, uh, but since we, we're in a part of it, it's probably very similar to what we're seeing. And Hubble has done a great job recently, particularly, of, of looking way beyond what it normally should have been able to see using gravitational lensing of galaxies to see things that go back uh, to uh, uh, the time when the first galaxies were being formed. So very neat stuff. Um, last year, uh, there, there was a some, the, the, the inflate, the inflation uh, period. Einstein's theory says something like this, blowing up this amount, would have caused a gravitational wave uh, that would propagate it through the universe, a wave of changing gravity. Uh, and and uh, you should be, if it exists, you should be able to feel it. Uh, we've, we've never seen one. Supernovas, there's, there's never been one measure. But last year, Bicep 2 said they saw it in the cosmic radiation because this wave would have caused some polarization to occur in the CMB. And they said they saw this particular type of polarization. Unfortunately for them, they used some bad data to um, uh, subtract out the, uh, the, there's the same polarization that is caused by gra gravitational waves is also present in our galaxy. So they had to take that out from the data. They were operating this thing at the South Pole, a hole in our, in our uh, atmosphere. But it wasn't good enough, and the size of the effect, they, they worked together subsequently with the Planck team, and the size of the effect they were measuring was about the size of the correction. And so it's shaking. But um, the, team, the team still believes it's there, um, and they're now doing another experiment it's called BICEP-3 at several different frequencies at higher accuracy. So uh, stay tuned. We may actually see this gravitation wave, but we won't see it in, uh, in its set, we'll see its effect on the cosmic radiation. Uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Planck information, uh, uh, implications for inflation. And uh, I, I'm gonna make this real simple, but this, what this is, is this red, uh, uh, blue area here is, uh, is mapped out, is, data, uh, is, is mapped out by Planck. And what it is, it measures the, the size, the ratio, the polarization to the temperature, uh, so the, the strength of the polarization to the strength of the temperature, that's this, uh, this factor here. And the spectral index has to do with the frequency dependence of the, uh, these uh, anisotropies. Well, they said all of this has to lie in this region. Well, this just about ruled out almost all models for inflation except the most simple ones, but it actually works out very well and it shows that the simplest model for inflation, the slow roll that I showed you much earlier, uh, is consistent with this data. And so even though they didn't see the smoking gun of the gravitational wave, they saw a pretty good confirmation that the, that cosmic inflation happened. Um, what's also amazing uh, is how much other stuff that is in this data, like uh, 50 technical papers. One of the other things, this is math, this is the density of matter, Hubble's constant, but this is the uh, sum of the density of neutrinos. So they actually are able to determine what the neutrino masses were. I mean, I, I don't you know, know how that comes out of here exactly by any means, but they, they, they mined this data in amazing ways and uh, were able to actually come up showing that uh, for sure that neutrinos have mass. Uh, there are particles uh, that are, that basically uh, don't interact with matter. Uh, and, and one of the candidates for dark matter is, is possibly neutrinos. But we, and neutrinos do have mass. But uh, anyway, that's, that's still all up in the air. Um, OK, so those are all the, the results from uh, Planck. But there's also some other uh, results, some anomalous results. So this is what the Planck 2013 data looked like. And it looked like there was a temperature difference in the, the, the Tempers are here and here, and there was a cold spot. Uh, and this line between them it was someone in, uh, in, in one of the, ma some magazine called it the axis of evil. 
and um, and you know, uh, and so because it shouldn't have been there. If the universe is uniform in every direction, uh, this is inconsistent with that. So some of the theories, well, and this is really uh, uh, um, uh, uh, speculative, but that this is caused by an interaction with another universe. Um, stay tuned. Uh, these things uh, seem to be real, continue to be studied. You can see, if you go online and Google cold spot, axis of evil, or dark flow, you'll see an enormous amount of speculation. The latest data, the Planck 2015 data, uh, seems to be devoid of this problem, but uh, there's been an awful lot of speculation about um, uh, these anomalous results. Okay, so I'm going to change gears here, and we'll talk a little bit about particle physics. With the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, <clears throat> there's been a, uh, uh, people have been looking at what role the Higgs mechanism uh, could have on cosmology. And one thing they found out was by measuring, now measuring the Higgs boson mass and the mass of the top quark, that we, our universe is metastable. And what that means is, uh, this is the uh, Higgs uh, potential, and uh, we have, or we exist at this point. But there's a lower energy, uh, a lower energy state that uh, exists. Uh, and but there's a there's a barrier there's a there's a, a, a barrier an energy barrier between them. But if somehow something could tunnel through this energy barrier, uh, the universe would instantly change uh, its nature. I mean, we all, all the physics that we know, all the uh, all uh, everything would be different. And but you can't worry too much about it. Unlike an asteroid that's coming at us, you can see it coming. You can't see this coming because it will hit you at the speed of light. So instantly everything would. Uh, but it's uh, it's not likely to happen. But uh, but it is uh, it is the, the the study of the Higgs uh, uh, has led to understanding. Yeah, we're, we're not in an unstable universe, but we're not in a perfectly stable one either. Uh, there's a lower energy um, state. The other thing that Higgs has done is that the field the Higgs field is very similar to the type of field that it is, that caused inflation. And initially, it thought it was the same thing. But the nature of the uh, inflation field, the shape of it, the slow roll part, isn't consistent with Higgs. But they, uh, some people have been doing some uh, modeling and said, well, if Higgs has any connection at all with gravity, if it, if it's, if it uh, is coupled with gravity. So this is that same curve that I showed you just a few minutes ago, where uh, you know, this is this, this R factor and this vector. That if there's, and these are the values of the coupling. So there are plenty of values if Higgs is actually uh, has a coupling to gravity that could produce a slow roll inflation. So Higgs could actually be the source uh, of uh, the inflation as well as giving mass to uh, the particles, as, you, as uh, some of you are probably aware. And it turns out that Higgs may also uh, be the source of uh, dark energy uh, and a related particle might be, and because the dark energy and inflation are really the two things that are almost the same concept. You have you have a, a negative uh, repulsive force. The inflation was a repulsive expansion of the universe. Demand. Dark energy is causing the same thing, but at a much slower rate, much weak, much much weaker. But a, a similar field could cause it. And so there's speculation that uh, the Higgs may actually be the source of this. And the significance of that is it would have a slow, it would have a role to it also. So the dark energy wouldn't necessarily be with us forever. It might be with uh, maybe eventually decay, like uh, inflation has uh, decayed. Okay, so uh, we're moving on to another topic, which is we're getting towards the end of this. But uh, the question about multiverses: uh, Is our universe merely one of billions? Uh, evidence of existing multiverses revealed. So uh, this is in uh, Daily Mail uh, a year or two ago. Uh, oh no, this is Thursday, July 5th, 2015. So this is, this is late, this is recent stuff. This is really recent, September 2015. This is, I just saw this today. <laughs> uh, I, I got this magazine, it was sitting in, uh, in, in our mail uh, when I got back from our travels. And so here it was in the astronomy magazine. This multiverse, science or science fiction. So anyway, this is a uh, this, there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, 
lot of attention being given to this. And what's interesting about it is with the confirmation, the growing confirmation that inflation occurred because of everything it explains, uh, that the, the, uh, the source of, of uh, structure in the universe, uh, the why the, uh, cosmic radiation looks the same, and, and the uh, flatness issue, all of that is looking so good, and then the Planck results. But one of the consequences of, um, of inflation is it might exist forever. And there may be potentially um, uh, other universes created. Because once this field begins, it doesn't end. So what it, because it's like nuclear decay, there would be a half-life. And so one region could leave the uh, inflation uh, and go down. But the regions that still were inflating are inflating very fast. Because the regions going out of inflation are leaving it very slowly, the slow roll. But the other regions are growing exponentially. So if Alan Booth's book, and this is a little, it's kind of a crummy graphic, but it does, uh, I'll walk you through this. So imagine, uh, this is time in this direction. Imagine a region, a false vacuum. So at, say at some point, a third of it disappears. Well, because of this, this, this region here that was left over is now, uh, now actually grown to be the full size of the first region. And same thing here. Then in another period of time, same amount of time, two more regions are, have left. But these small little areas of false vacuum continue, are actually that big. So if you, you could actually have the, the graph, it becomes impossible. And, uh, and, it, and it continues forever. And so uh, because, uh, and, and so it, it suggests, and this is the nature of, of the beast, it suggests that once it starts, yes, individual universes get spun out of it. He's calling them pocket universes. But in fact, the process could go on uh, forever. And, um, and as I say, it creates a fractal-like pattern that uh, looks the same at, uh, at, all, 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 uh, at all scales. And once it starts, it goes forever. So <clears throat> that's the multiverse. And that's, this is not the only theory for the multiverse. But I have to like it simply because it, inflation is looking very real. And this is one of the consequences of inflation that the multiverse exists. So Andre Lindy was one, along with Alan Booth, was one uh, was one of the uh, uh, real proponents of, of inflation theory uh, back in the uh, 1986. He, uh, he, this is a quote from a paper he wrote then. Because the old question, why our universe is the only possible one, is now replaced by the question in which theories of the existence of many universes of our type are possible. This question is still very difficult, but it is much easier than the previous one. Why our universe is the way it is. Um, you know, it's been uh, Krauss in his book calls physics an, a, um, an environmental science because he, the, the the particle the particle theory uh, that uh, standard model particle theory uh, there are 60 elementary particles and 19 adjustable parameters. So this does not have the feel of something really fundamental. And, uh, and that these, uh, these things are discoverable, uh, but are not, uh, are not fundamental. And so parallel universes would likely have the same physics, but there's little reason uh, that they would have the same properties. For example, if the Higgs field was different in another universe, the mass of the particles would be different. The you know, physics of, uh, of all the elements would be different. So the universe would be totally different. And uh, so this gives a reason, uh, one reason why we, we, are, why we are so finely tuned to, to make everything that we have here, uh, uh, our lives, our universe, our Earth, uh, the way it is. Because it's not, it's not just one, it's one of an infinite number of possibilities. And you figure in an infinite number, there might be one that has just this proper mix of, uh, of uh, adjustable parameters and particles that, get, that behave to give us our universe the way we know it. So um, we're, we're getting to the uh, we're getting to the end of the talk, which is the beginning and the end. <laughs> All right. So so one question you might have asked: Well, where did this false vacuum region arise to begin with? Uh, we started this process of inflation and eternal inflation. Uh, and a more fundamental question uh, is: Did the universe have to have a beginning? Well, it turns out, Alex, I'll answer that question quickly. Alex Lincoln, in his book, 
Many Worlds at One. And it's a readable book, not as readable as Krauss's book on the universe of nothing, but it's readable. It's not meant for, a, it, it's meant for a lay people to read. But he proves that, and, and you can almost understand it, he shows that a universe that is expanding, <laughs> you can almost understand it. If you read his book, he explains it fairly carefully, but I don't want to take the time to do it. But you can almost understand it by saying, if a, he says the universe is, uh, has to have a beginning, because the consequence of an expanding universe without a beginning would cause objects to go faster than the speed of light at some point. And uh, he proves this. And it's a fairly simple proof. But uh, So the universe did have a beginning. It did not was, has not been expanding forever. Uh, but then the question is, what is the beginning? What 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 happened? How did it happen? All right. Okay. And as I say, this we're now in the spec we're now in the thing area of things we don't know. But uh, th this is one possible um, scenario, and you can't test it. It's, it's, but it doesn't violate any known physics. So Valenkin, in the same book, proposes a possibility which has the minimal number of uh, of uh, which has the absence of everything in the existence, absence of space and time. If you can somehow get that in your head. Um, the only thing that has to exist are the laws of quantum physics, and he points it out is it's the mind, not the matter, that, that exists. But if you, if you posit this, uh, that uh, nothing exists except the laws of physics exist, so a closed spherical universe with zero energy of the type our, you know, our universe, while it's not closed spherical, it has zero energy. And it turns out all spherical universes have zero, zero energy, filled with the Higgs-like field, and a certain amount of order of matter could appear spontaneously because, and because it has, and that's because of the uh, of quantum physics. Quantum physics says things happen uh, without a cause, and they usually uh, don't last very long. Uh, but the, it, at, if, if this thing has zero energy, which, it, uh, which it, we're positing that it does, and our universe does, uh, the uncertainty principle does not limit it because if, any, if it had a positive uh, amount of energy, uh, the, the uncertainty principle says it can last only a certain amount of time. But if it has zero energy, there's no limit to how long it can last. Now, the vast majority of these, uh, of these spontaneous universes would collapse back to themselves and disappear very quickly. However, even a vanishingly small universe has a non-zero probability of lasting long enough. And this doesn't seem like very long, but it's long enough. <laughs> it's long enough for the period of inflation to have produced this hot mix of high energy particles and radiation and to drive the universe precisely into the critical density, the flatness, which we, uh, which we observe. So, uh, uh, so, yeah, it's not a high probability, but it's not zero. And if you, if you act, well, wait millennia for it to happen, it could happen. So the scenario is not testable, but it is plausible and does not violate any physics. So this is a universe from literally nothing. And Krauss's uh, book uh, talks about the fact that nothing is actually unstable. Something will always come from nothing. That's kind of what we're saying there. Okay, so the, now we're at the end. That's the beginning. So what's the end? Okay. In two trillion years, uh, two followed by 12 zeros, all evidence of the Big Bang, that is the cosmic microwave radiation, and, and a few other things, will have disappeared. Our local group of 30 galaxies will have collapsed into one and the other 100 uh, plus billion other galaxies will disappear from the site. And, uh, and in fact, the, near, the, sooner, the, the first event in this sequence is going to happen in 4 billion years where the Milky Way and the Andromeda uh, collide. Um, the universe will, interestingly enough, appear like scientists thought 100 years ago. Sci 100 years ago, now, if you ask you, a scientist what the universe was, he would say the Milky Way. That's it. It's our galaxy. That's the way it's going to look like at this time, because all you're going to see is one galaxy and no, no other galaxies. They've all been out of this field of view. They've been, so they've been actually moving faster than the speed of light, so the light from them can't get to you. Uh, the universe will expand it that fast. And so at some point, the universe hits light speed uh, again, uh, the expansion, just like it did, just like the expansion did during inflation was faster than the speed of light. It could eventually get faster than the speed of light again due to this dark energy. Okay, um, in a hundred trillion years, the last stars will have died, and all that remains are their corpses, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. In 4,000 trillion, trillion, trillion years, four followed by 40 zeros, 
The only source of radiation throughout the universe is from the feeble Hawking radiation coming from black holes. Hawking showed that black holes weren't totally black. They do emit, uh, they do emit radiation. And uh, so he's, uh, he, uh, but they, even that, so that's all there's going to be. But in 10 followed by 98 zeros, even a 100 billion solar mass black hole will have disappeared. So all that remains is diffuse cold matter, the big freeze. But there may be, it may not be this bleak. <laughs> if dark energy decays, uh, uh, because it is actually, uh, it is kind of like on a super slow roll, but it's just like the inflation decayed and gave us our, uh, all the particles for the Big Bang. Uh, if this actually is a process, that it could, that repulsive uh, uh, force will disappear and gravitation will take over again and it could uh, collapse and we get the big crunch and we start over again. And then there's also the possibility of other universes, the multi -universes. So that's, uh, that's, um, that's the end. And uh, so in summary, um, just the Big Bang model explains the expansion of the universe, the existence of the cosmic radiation, and the amount of light elements. Uh, recent data show that it's uh, driven the universe to a critical energy density with no spatial curvature and with the numbers that I've talked about before. A quantum fluctuation and inflation in a state of zero net energy may be the origin of the universe, a universe from nothing. Inflation also solves problems with the structure, the flatness, and the horizon problems. Um, Planck satellite has refined the Big Bang model and strongly supports inflation. Uh, the model, and it, it supports the simple models that, uh, that, 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 are, that, that we, we need, the slow roll where there's enough time to build up uh, to flatten the universe and fill up all the necessary number of particles. The universe is in a metastable state based on the measurements of Cape Boson and could revert, not likely, to a lower energy state where everything would change, but we won't see it coming. Um, the Higgs field may turn out to be the source of inflation and dark energy, a neat result if it holds up. And uh, the universe will expand forever and die in a cold death after 10 to the 99 years, the big, uh, the, the big freeze. But if uh, if dark energy disappears, who knows? So that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
the idea is that you know you think about the Big Bang. Well, it, the Big Bang existed in something else first. You know, it was, there was something there, and it just is, you know, all space and matter exists. It is is uh, is and, and it's it's and it, it looks the same no matter where you are. And, and so to think of it as a sphere, it does work. Yeah. Is everybody doing that? So, so we're in a race between expansion, velocity, and dark energy, repulsive force. So the repulsive force is phase not and expansion stalls out, and then we go backwards. Otherwise, yeah. now, when you say we go to the decrease option, option, it's kind of counterintuitive to think that all that matters is real matter. Yeah, well, you see, the trouble is, is that, that it's, it's burned out all of the, uh, the yeah, uh, fusion material is gone, all the stars are burned through all of the, they, they burn through everything that they have to burn, and uh, that's, and that's it, yeah. But, but see, what's, what's amazing about it, though, is that all of that came from nothing. <laughs> In the beginning. We had a big spark, and, and it was this, this, Hypothetical uh, quantum fluctuation that uh, that everything, uh, which included this uh, magical potion of, uh, I, but you know it's not totally magical because the Higgs uh, particle exists. There's a Higgs field associated with the particle, uh, and just like the electromagnetic ray of photon, and this that field is has the properties of this uh, negative uh, uh, pressure, and so I mean. It, Measurement of the Higgs provides a lot of uh, makes people say, well, you know, if it can, if if, it, if that's the way the Higgs behaves, why why can't something else, you know, be responsible for something something very similar? So, measurement of the Higgs has uh, uh, helped bolster some of these theories. Yeah. Over right. here. If you got all these galaxies disappearing. You've got an awful lot of photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got to get moving here. Yeah, yeah they're going, they're disappearing on me. Yeah. My question is one of your simpler concepts of your the cosmic um, inflation. Why? I think you answered it. Why is it not observable for the universe to be like? Of course, it will be later on. Is that because of the classic? Well, I'm really there's there's two processes that I talked about here. One is the dark energy, which is the slow process that is happening now, yeah. uh, and the universe is expanding. But um, and uh, but then the cosmic inflation will occur in, in the a blink of a uh, you know an eye at the very beginning of, of the uh, of, of the of our of our universe. And so there there are separate processes totally, uh, but. Uh, Well, uh, can, everybody, can everybody hear that? Yeah. What what would cause a, a transition from this metal stable to a possibly lower state? And uh, things like that uh, can happen. Um, uh, well, there's something called quantum tunneling, where particles can actually go through a, a quantum barrier. And you know, so there there are mechanisms that could cause, but the probabilities of these things are, are can be really low. But what's the parameter that would actually um, it's, it's, it's probability. It's, it, the probability exists that this could happen. Quantum physics is based on probabilities. So the probability is really low, but it's not zero. So nothing has to change, it just has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> the probability of it happening is not very high, but it, it can happen. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to change them very much either. That that's where that six numbers. Uh, yeah. you know, Reese talks about that in the six numbers. You don't have to change these. Pra you don't have to change the Higgs uh, field very much, the Higgs mass very much to change everything. 
And that's why it doesn't, you know, as Carl says, it's in, become a, an environmental science. It's, it's, it, we have these graph, these numbers exist, but there's no, there's no way you can derive it from something more fundamental. We're measuring, we're not deriving. So they could be anything, they just happen to be what they are. And, and we happen to be here because of that. And, uh, uh, and there's the, uh, Anthropic principle. We are here. Things are the way they are because we're here. <laughs> we're here because the way they, 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 they are not different. <laughs> yeah, so that's called the anthropic principle. And, uh, you Google that if you want. You'll, you'll get it here for sure. At the barbecue, Buster. Along with the ribs. Yeah, if um, if some of you want to, uh, you know, while we're putting the chairs away and all, I have um, I have this astronomy magazine uh, here, but I also have the books, um, the four books that I reference. Uh, uh, there is a this book, the Sean Carroll book, is really great. It's uh, if you want to understand uh, how the Higgs hat was discovered, and he doesn't go into any of this stuff that I've been talking about about how Higgs can fit into the uh, cosmological model. But he does talk about what the Higgs is and what it does and what happens. And then the Belenkin book, Many Worlds in One, and Charles' book, A Universe in One. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> if not, first three things. And first of all, we do not have to put the chairs away tonight. So I'm not going to ask you to move them to one side or the other. Secondly, in two weeks' uh, time, uh, Dr. Bob Tilling, a member of the geologist Jackson Hole, who is a um, uh, scientist emeritus, volcanologist emeritus with the United States Geological Survey, will be showing a movie that we've shown in past years, about four or five years ago, called The Year Without Summer, which is about the largest volcanic eruption in recorded history at, at Tambora in Indonesia in 1815. So we're on the 200th uh, anniversary uh, this summer. So it makes it sort of appropriate. And then he will uh, talk about um, what's seen in that movie and, uh, and offer the audience the opportunity to query things like, what if that happens again in our lifetime? Uh, because it will happen again, not necessarily in our lifetime. So, that would be a really good one in two weeks' time here, I think. And the last thing, I guess the third thing, is I would just like to ask you to join me in thanking 